Okay. Can you see that one? I can see perfectly. <laughs> Sorry, the lobby thing. OK, so my name is Lauren and I work here at the University of Durham. And this morning I'm going to be telling you more about applying to university more generally. So despite the fact this picture is just Durham, I'm not actually talking about Durham particularly. <laughs> it is a lovely place, but this is more about your options. So things like how you might want to choose a course, uh, the questions you might be asking yourself, you might be asking universities, and how you might want to choose universities as well. So do you ask any questions as you think of them or if you want to wait till the end in case I cover them anyway. But first of all, not to overwhelm you, but there are currently around about 376 higher education institutions in the UK and there's over 50,000 courses or course combinations possible. So I appreciate this is meant to be narrowing down your options, but just to start from the broadest possible base, you have so many opportunities. And the vast majority of these courses and subjects you probably haven't studied before, either at university, sorry, either at high school or at any of your previous education. Quite a lot of them you might never have heard before at all. So it is very daunting as a first time to start looking at what you want to do for the rest of your university life. So these are probably some of the things you already know if you're already considering university. Um, but a lot of people might wonder why exactly you go to university. Uh, some people might already have placements or potentially think they can get jobs. So just as some introduction to the benefits of university. Obviously, better job opportunities and higher salaries. Um, so it is an average. Some people might earn more or less, but over your lifetime, you might earn up to half a million more uh, than non graduates, which is always nice. <laughs> Mostly personally. I would go for the opportunity to actually study a subject that you're passionate about. Remember, university is very different to school. So in school, you may have textbooks, you may have to work through them, you have to do exams and it can feel quite prescriptive. Once you get to university, you're studying about it and researching it of your own volition. It's a subject you enjoy and you're learning more about it. And eventually you may actually be contributing to the research in that field, which is always nice. You get to meet experts. Uh, so when you go to university on your course, you will be surrounded by other people who are equally as passionate about that course, which can be really nice. Again, in school, quite often you're put in classes where everyone has to study that subject um, and you meet people who might particularly hate that subject. I remember I really passionately hated maths and I brought down the whole class with my negativity. Whereas if you get to go to university, you will be surrounded by other people who enjoy studying it. You can bounce ideas off them and it can feel like a very different sort of environment. Also, the student life, which I will talk a bit more about. It's not just the course. It's not just the academics that you do at university. It's the life you live outside of that. So the skills you might gain from things like clubs and societies, activities you do beyond the academics and the people you meet. In the UK, the majority of students don't stay in their hometown. So even students who are from the UK will usually be moving to go to university. They will be living somewhere new. They will usually be living within university residence for the first year. So almost everyone you meet at university will be in a new place for the first time living. The first time having to pay their own bills and do their own laundry for most of them. <laughs> so you kind of get to grow up with other people learn from other people and meet people from all over the world with all different interests. And of course, you get transferable skills, not just laundry. That's a great transferable skills. You should learn that as soon as possible, but things that you can add to your CV. So they might be things like time management, organization skills, communication skills. So it's not just what you learn. If you do a history course, most employers don't care what date something happened on, but they do care about your critical analysis skills. Uh, your ability to write a good report and these are the kind of things you get from university sometimes regardless of the course you do the other side of the coin is it actually right for me so again most people i assume the vast majority haven't really experienced university before they apply so it's hard to say if you're going to enjoy it obviously so in some ways it might be similar 
you have lectures or seminars which tend to be smaller than lectures and they can sometimes feel like a class depending on what your current classes are like <laughs> lectures tend to be quite passive you're meant to go and gain the relevant foundational knowledge for that particular module or course seminars are usually more interactive you might be presenting some research you've done you might be working together with a group depending on what the course is you might be doing fieldwork reports, you might be presenting research you've done, but they're more interactive. The main difference is the contact hours and how prescripted things might be. So in class, you often have people checking to make sure you're there, checking that you do homework, checking that you've actually done the classwork, and to a certain extent, you can't get away with things. <laughs> Once you get to university, it's all on you. This is where I think enjoying your subject is probably the most important thing because you might have something like a 200 hour course of which 170 hours is independent research that's 170 hours over the course of the year where you're expected to motivate yourself to either go to the library or go to the lab to do your reports to do your research to do the reading by yourself if you don't do it you're not going to have tutors and supervisors saying why weren't you in the library at 9 a.m. this morning? You're just going to possibly fail your course. <laughs> it is on you to actually do the work. So the biggest difference is the independence, not just in terms of doing your own laundry, but in terms of doing your own course. <laughs> so do be aware of that. And it is a three or four year commitment. So most undergraduate degrees in the UK are three years. If you do an integrated master's, it can be four years or languages tend to be four years but it means that you are kind of committing to that subject for three or four years. It's not like school where you might be able to drop it later. <laughs> you are stuck with that one, give or take. So again, make sure you do actually enjoy the subject. So choosing a course, the main point. So some people might be really lucky. You might already know what kind of job you want. And quite often jobs might have specific degrees or types of degree that you need to get there. You're to an extent almost fine. <laughs> you might have a couple of subjects that you really like, uh, either subjects you've studied in school or subjects you've heard about, um, you've looked into and you can't choose between them. And some people have absolutely no idea, which is a surprisingly large number of people, especially when you think 50,000 or more courses available. So I can send you the email in case you don't catch it later, but there is quite a good website. I think it was set up in conjunction with UCAS called Informed Choices. Um, it helps you to look at what subject groups might open up different degrees. Uh, so for example, if you want to work for a business or for a company or in business, very, very rarely do you actually need a business degree. <laughs> so you might be surprised by how many different careers do not require specific courses and by how many courses give you the skills and in some cases uh, academic knowledge to go into that career. So informed choices is quite good at grouping subjects together, uh, giving you an idea of the different kind of skills. So it might be a good website to check out if you are completely uncertain. As for the other questions. Here's some more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> that might help you narrow that down slightly. Um, so again, personally, I still think that passion is the most important thing. So if you can ask yourself, is there something you're interested in? It could be a general subject area, a specific course, a specific topic. Um, personally, I studied classics and I always liked it mostly for literature, things like the Odyssey. So I was interested in the Odyssey. <laughs> So expanding on that, you have a lot of different options. You have languages, you have history, you have anthropology, archaeology. Um, but can you find something that you're already interested in and see which topics are related to it? Do you have particular skills you want to learn? So can you find something that will teach you those skills? And um, again, these could be quite broad skills. If you think in the future you want to do something that involves people, can you find a course that teaches you good communications and interpersonal skills? And to be honest, most degrees might do that. That was probably a bad choice. Um, but you might look at something like anthropology, which can teach you cultural sensitivity or politics um, languages. Again, where you're living abroad, you're learning to communicate. 
Um, so think about perhaps what skills you might want in your future life and your strengths. Again, this might come from school. Is there a subject you're particularly good at? Maybe it's not the subject that's your strength, but it's a particular technique or skill that you use within that subject. Um, so, for example, if you're really good at languages, but maybe you don't think you want to study languages, or maybe computer programming, the logical thinking that's required for language skills, you know, grammar, vocabulary, that applies to computer programming too. It also applies to music to a certain extent and maths. So if you think about the subjects you're good at in school, try and distill it down to what exactly you're good at within those subjects and see if you can think of other courses. Again, informed choices and other websites like that can help, but try and match subjects to those skills, perhaps. Then you've got availability. Another good way to narrow down the options. Um, if you've already got an idea of what institution you're looking at or institutions, which universities or which locations. Just going to throw in there that London is not the be all and end all. Durham is also a great location north of England. Very beautiful. Um, but if you already have an idea of where you want to study. Is that course offered? If you've got a wide range of courses, but you know where you want to study, match them. <laughs> Um, and does it offer any extra opportunities? Are you looking for a placement year or a study abroad year? So that's the opportunity to study that course in a different country or the opportunity to uh, do a work placement for a year or six months. So again, you can narrow them down with extra opportunities. Careers. Um, so this is both sides of the coin. Uh, do you have a career in mind that requires a specific course? So the obvious things would be things like medicine, engineering, architecture. I think by and large you do have to have degrees in those subjects to become one of those things. By contrast, like I said earlier, most other careers are open access. You can actually do them using any degree, uh, even law. You don't actually need a law degree to become a lawyer. Uh, you can do law conversion courses and in some cases it's actually more beneficial to your overall career. Uh, so, for example, if you did a science degree and then did a law conversion course, you have the opportunity to get more niche knowledge. Your science degree might help you get specific science related law jobs, uh, which other people might not have the opportunities for. One of the highest paid jobs I ever knew was a friend who had a degree in science and went into patenting. Because if a chemist or a pharmacist says they've invented a new drug, you need a lawyer with enough knowledge about chemistry to say whether or not that is a new drug or not. Very well paid, crazy well paid. Anywho, <laughs> and then requirements again, another practical option. Does the course meet your requirements for the first half? Uh, so if you're thinking about uh, something like uh, history is probably the easiest one. You think you like history, but maybe like me, you like a specific part of history. You want to study ancient history. So if you're looking at a course called history, make sure it includes what you're actually interested in. History degrees across the UK, some of them will only cover modern history. Some of them might cover random bits of history from all over the world. Some of them will only be British history. If you have a passion, check that the course you're applying for meets that. And vice versa, will you meet their requirements? Um, so this might be another easy way of filtering out courses. Uh, most universities will have entry requirements on their website, so you can check and see whether you're on track to meet those entry requirements. Um, actually, sorry, UCAS would be an easier place. They're all on UCAS. Don't bother going to individual websites yet. Um, you can look on UCAS and sort of filter your results by whether or not you're on track to meet those entry requirements. And again, even if that particular course at that university, you don't think you'll meet the entry requirements, it doesn't mean you can't find a very similar or almost the same course elsewhere. Possibly in the northeast of England. <laughs> so again, just to go back to careers, because this seems to be one of the biggest topics people think about. A lot of people might worry about limiting their course, sorry, their options. Um, if you are particularly passionate about something that doesn't have an obvious career, again, classics. <laughs> Um, my teacher once told me that the only career I could get with classics was writing gravestones because she thinks gravestones should be in Latin. Or as a journalist for the Vatican, 
because they also speak Latin. But in the modern world, you actually find that most employers, again, they're looking for the skills, not the academic knowledge. So a lot of graduate programs, they require a 2-1 in any degree. So if you're looking at places like JP Morgan, Deloitte, big international companies, Google, quite often you don't need to have a specific business degree, management degree, marketing degree. In some cases, you don't even need the accountancy and finance degrees. Um, they can train you. I mean, they'll have to train you anyway in their own systems um, in how they work as a company. So, so long as you've got the skills which you gain from your degree, you don't necessarily need the specific knowledge. So just as an example, you can see some of the jobs that Durham students went on to. Uh, maths, working as merchandising for New Look, I think it's quite fun. Um, history, uh, executive for Paddy Power, the gambling site, I think. And there you go, English literature became an accountant for KPMG. <laughs> so it's not necessarily true that your course is going to define your career. When you're choosing a course at university, you're not saying, right, for the next 65 years or whatever the pension age is now, I'm going to be doing this. So don't worry as much about that. So finally, things that you might think about as priorities for your course. Again, remember that the content can differ. So if you've decided on marine biology, that doesn't necessarily mean marine biology at every university is going to be the same. So actually check into the course details, the modules, um, particularly options you can do in second and third year, they can be quite specific. From that, you might have to look at UCAS, but you might have to go to individual universities' websites to get more information about the course specifics. But you might also consider facilities. So again, if you're looking at science, for example, you might want specific equipment, um, archaeology, you might want to look at specific locations that have access to sites or digs um, that might have partnerships with places in Europe. Sorry, fixating on Romans again. <laughs> but specific facilities and links might be important to your chosen career. Teaching quality. Uh, most UK universities have a very high standard of teaching, um, but you can find, um, what are they called? Quality assurance marks, uh, things like TEF. Um, is it accredited? Uh, so if you do have a career in mind, things like marketing or accountancy, you might find that many UK courses are accredited, which means that you don't have to take certain exams or you're exempted from them or you've already done part of a course in order to become a professional in that career. Uh, so the Chartered Institute of Marketing, uh, Chartered Institute of Accountants, things like that, you may find courses come with that accreditation uh, that allows you to kind of skip some tests you might have to do in a future career. League table scores. Personally, I'm not sure that they're always important, but if you look at them, try and look at the subject based ones. Um, just because a university is good overall doesn't mean it's really good for that particular subject. Uh, and student surveys. Although again, I would take them with a pinch of salt because people who have a problem tend to complain the loudest, whereas people who are content and happy quite often don't say anything. <laughs> unfortunately for student surveys, but they can be a very good indicator of things that a university does particularly strongly. So second part, choosing a university. <laughs> a lot of this might be narrowed down by your course choice at this point anyway, but with UCAS you can apply to up to five universities or up to five courses within one or any variation thereon, um, except for medicine and medical courses where you can only do four. So the obvious one is, does it actually offer the course you want? <laughs> Again, you might look at league tables or the Russell Group. Um, personally, I'm not sure that Russell Group makes much difference. Uh, Russell Group is a group of universities that are research intensive. So for some subjects or if you're interested in going into further research, this might be helpful. And uh, one of the main ways Russell Group affects your undergraduate degree is that the courses might change. So a lot of the academics doing teaching are also doing research. Um, so usually in Russell Group universities, you don't have teachers. You have researchers who are teaching. Um, as such, some of the modules, the different courses, they might change slightly as the academics change their own research. But Russell Group doesn't particularly affect undergraduates, to be honest. The location. This is Durham, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but you find that you have 375 odd higher education institutions. They are covering the entire 
width and breadth of the UK. So you might end up going somewhere you've never heard of before, somewhere you may have never even visited, um, but you can find some really fun places to live. And most university cities, they have everything you could want. So you're never going to find a university that's in the middle of a rural village. So if you want student life, every university is going to have something to offer in that sense. And the UK is actually quite small. I'm not sure exactly where everyone is from, but this normally surprises people that Durham and London are pretty far apart, but it's about three hours by train. Less if the trains run on time and as described. Um, we're only 12 minutes from Newcastle, very close to Edinburgh, Scottish capital. And these are all pretty major cities and the UK is relatively small. So actually being in the northeast doesn't change that much in terms of your student experience. If you think about traveling across London, if any of you ever have, it can take you an hour just to get from like like Heathrow to the middle of London is like an hour. And by that time you could be in Manchester instead. Much nicer than Heathrow Airport. <laughs> so do think about the locations, the other options you have. Uh, maybe it's time for a change, go somewhere new. Your other option is types of university. So one of the main types in the UK is campus universities. This means that everything is in one place. It's almost like its own miniature town. Uh, so the picture you can see, I have actually completely forgotten which university that is. Maybe Southampton? <laughs> Oops. It's a, an example of a campus university. So the buildings you can see there, they will be everything. They will be accommodation, they will be lecture theatres, they will be the laboratories you need. Uh, you can see the sports tracks. Um, you will have student union, which is where clubs and societies happen. Every element of a university will be on the campus somewhere. Quite often campuses are so big that you might need shuttle buses or like transport to get around them. Um, and they're often surrounded by some kind of like fields or uh, grounds, which can be quite a nice place to live. They're usually just to the side of a major city, um, so they're quite easy to access, you know, shops. There are normally shops and supermarkets on campus, but if you're looking for things like New Look and Waterstones, you might have to get a bus into the nearest town, for example. Collegiate universities are pretty rare, and honestly, this is only on here because I work at Durham. <laughs> Durham is a collegiate university. <laughs> collegiate universities are kind of a mixture of campus and city. So Oxford and Cambridge are the most famous two. Uh, Durham, to an extent, York. Colleges are basically like, if everyone's seen or read Harry Potter, the college system is like the Hogwarts system. So in Hogwarts, all the students belong to one of their houses, but they all go together to their potions class, for example. You get Gryffindor and Slytherin going to the same potions class. Um, in colleges, you might represent uh, your college team, just like you have Gryffindor representing Gryffindor for Quidditch. But you're also part of Hogwarts overall. Sorry, college, university overall. <laughs> so collegiate universities, they are like miniature campuses, tiny campuses, that's a college. And everyone in the colleges is a member of the overall university, which is spread across the city. So it's probably a bit hard to tell on this map, but that is the whole of Durham City and all of the colleges and university buildings are spread across the city and each college will have a variety of different facilities like cooking facilities, a bar, some of them have theatres, gyms, kind of like your campus but on a much smaller scale and spread around the city. Then you have city universities which are basically as described, the university is spread across the city. Uh, London universities are like this, so I think this is King's College London, maybe? <laughs> so you would have to cross the city of London in order to find your lecture halls or your accommodation. Sorry. And the people you meet on the street are just going to be people from London, uh, residents, uh, tourists. You're not stuck in a campus where everybody is related to the university. Honestly, it's entirely personal preference. If you want to be in the heart of a city or if you want to be on campus, it's entirely up to you. You might also think about the size. Um, so how many students are there? Do you want to go to a university with a smaller student population? Uh, and how many people in the course or on your class, for example? Again, colleges can help with this. 
colleges at Durham, we have 4,000 new students per year, but every college is only up to about 500 new students. So you do get that small feeling in a large university. Always loved it. And accommodation. Does the university offer accommodation? Um, the cost of living, for example, in the area. How close are you to where you're doing your lectures? Do you need ensuite or shared facilities, for example? Accommodation might be a big um, deciding factor for your university location. And as I mentioned before, the opportunities like study abroad, uh, your field work if you need to do any, placement year and career prospects. So most universities have a careers centre that can help you with finding a job, <laughs> preparing for your future career. Um, but if you're looking for something specific, you might be looking for a university with industrial links, for example. If you're looking at creative subjects, you might want a university that already has established links with the fashion industry or with the gaming industry, for example. Finally, just five minutes on what is probably the most important. I'm sorry I should have started with this. It's far more important than course and university, but student life. I spent a lot of time waffling on about courses and universities, but for many students, what they remember the most is actually their experience. Um, so this is things like the groups and societies you join, uh, what you do outside your course when you're not in lectures. So most universities, they have all kinds of sports, drama, music, random clubs. Um, obviously, the city itself, if it's a city university or a collegiate university, you can go to clubs, nightclubs and everything just within the city. So just as an example, because I only really know about Durham at this point, these are all the university sports teams that Durham has. So you might want to try something completely new. You get to compete against other universities, so you might travel around the country. Um, Durham has a college system, so if you think, oh, I've never tried fencing before, <laughs> I personally have never tried fencing before, you might want to join a college team instead, which is more casual. So in addition to these university teams, Durham has 700 different sports teams across all of our colleges. Uh, one college has 14 football teams just within that college, and um, they can basically set up their own league. But it's a chance for you to try something new make new friends, quit after a week if you don't enjoy it, <laughs> or travel the country and become a professional rugby player whilst doing a maths degree. <laughs> a lot of students actually find their careers from what they do beyond their course. Um, Durham has no drama or journalism, um, any kind of broadcasting courses, but we have a lot of graduates that went on to careers famously in those subjects because they did student journalism outside their course they did acting, they did screenwriting, they did the lighting or the costume design for student theatre. So you get a lot of good career skills from these. I personally joined women's rugby team. It was great, very good stress relief. So long as you don't go for the neck, anything else is fine. Um, but I still don't really know how to win a game of rugby, but it was great fun. Theatre and music is another big one. Again, most students um, in university, when you do student theatre, it's not just acting. So maybe if you've done high school acting, for example, you know, teachers might decide on the play or help you set up the stage. At university, there's no teachers helping you. Everything is on you. If you want to write a script and get your friends to perform it, you can. If you want to learn how to do the electricals, the lighting, the sound, the music, you can. If you want to do the budgeting, the finance, how do you actually market and advertise a student performance? That's all down to students too. So again, you make really good links, you make good networking with other students and sometimes with professionals. Um, so they can be really good opportunities. And it's not just like one school play a term. Durham, for example, does 80 different productions a year. So there's always opportunities. Even if you think you're maybe not the best actor, 80 productions, you can surely get in there somewhere. <laughs> we have 26 different theatre companies and 90 different music societies. So again, it's all levels. If you've never even picked up a recorder, you can still join and learn. And lastly, random groups and societies. Every university has a students union, which is both a group of people who represent students nationally and to the university, and usually a physical building. Uh, it's most famous normally for its bar, but often it also has rooms and 
uh, spaces for student societies. So again, it's up to you to set these up to run them, but they can be anything. Um, it's a good chance to meet people if you have niche interests. <laughs> uh, this is our current list. They will change quite often, so some of them might only have two or three people, and if they graduate and no one carries it on, they might disappear. Uh, some of them might be very time specific. Uh, Avengers Endgame uh, filmed in Durham in the cathedral and no one was expecting it, but Chris Hemsworth showed up in the middle of Durham for like a week and he ended up with the largest student society, the Chris Hemsworth Spotting Society. But obviously after one year it kind of fizzled out because he didn't come back. <laughs> I think they were very disappointed by that. <laughs> but there's a lot of these that will always be open. Things like cultural societies, language exchanges, um, so things like the French, Bulgarian, people who speak it or want to speak it, who want to know what Bulgarian food is, um, food societies. I think Choc Sock, chocolate society is always one of the most popular. Um, I think nationally someone did a survey and hummus appreciation societies are on average the largest across the UK. <laughs> not sure why. Most universities also now have Quidditch teams. Also not entirely sure why. <laughs> but yes, you can join almost anything, meet new people, decide you're not sure about these new people and quit and join something else. Very flexible, but again, a great way to make friends, learn new skills uh, and learn new things. So just to finish, as a warning, uh, UCAS you can start submitting your applications from early September. So if you're planning to go to university next year, you can submit from this September. If you're planning to apply for Oxford, Cambridge, medicine, dentistry or veterinary courses, there is an early deadline, October 15th. And this is a bit flexible, but the deadline for courses, the equal consideration deadline, at uh, UCAS is usually on the 15th of January, but during COVID it has changed slightly, so I'm not sure for this year. I think it's back to the 15th, um, but this is the deadline for anyone who submits before this time, you are all considered equally. It's not a first come first serve kind of thing, um, so particularly for courses that are very competitive or institutions that are very selective, I do recommend you get it in before that deadline. After that deadline, universities can start to close courses. So if they have too many applications, um, they can start to close after January 15th. And yeah, before January 15th, you can submit your application in October or January 14th, and it will be considered equally. Um, so yes, do be aware of those ones. But otherwise, I think that's end of my brief information so I'm not sure if any questions have been popping up as we went. <laughs> awesome I see that made sound go up about 20 minutes ago it went down very quickly to sound it but it only went up for like one second. Please, um, if you want to ask a question just put your virtual hand up and I just sort of go to you one by one so everybody doesn't talk. Ahmed you look to give a question you can start the ball rolling. OK, yeah, no, I, I just kind of put it up. I didn't realize that um, you weren't taking questions during the um, thing for some reason. But yeah, yes. um, I'm I noticed that you mentioned something about tutors and that they didn't provide tutors, but I thought that there was a system where you could pay for like college tutors or something. That was a thing. Sorry, like so tuition, I, um, <laughs> I think it's called. So also, I've never heard of that, Ahmed. Um, uh, maybe maybe uh, Lauren will know differently, but you know, <clears throat> I think you would be talking about maybe a private tutor, because uh, you just would pay the, uh, unless I'm wrong, Lauren, you would just pay the course fees, and that comes what you get, and you can't sort of pay for extra lessons based. Uh, well, I've never heard of it unless it's a new thing. Um, yes, yeah, sort of. Um, I should also apologise, I couldn't actually see anyone else, so I was just staring at a blank screen, so I didn't see anyone raising their hands. Apologies. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, uh, the only time I've heard of college uh, tutors, I have to admit I've heard it from American applicants, and it was tutors getting them into college, so like pre 
college tuition to try and help them get on a particular course right. um, rather than at university. Um, but yeah, as Mr. Wonen said, you pay a tuition fee and that covers any lectures, any seminars. Most universities do have some kind of, they're called a tutor, but they're designed to help you academically, but not on a one to one basis. So they might direct you to uh, additional courses. So Durham, for example, has academic writing skills. If you're not sure how to write an essay, most people actually aren't when they start university. <laughs> Um, they do courses that can help you with academic writing skills, for example. Um, if you are struggling with a particular course, you can normally go to that course director and say, I'm struggling with this, this and this. And they might have, for example, like classes with students who are also uh, struggling. Yeah. People will always try and help you, um, but it's not the kind of one to one tuition you might be thinking of. Um, so okay. in a sense, yes, people will always help you. Uh, they want you to pass, they want you to succeed, but no, you can't have like a a one to one teacher uh, usually okay. to my knowledge. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK, cool. Thank you. Alexandra. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. OK, I wanted to ask in regards to the UCAS applications. Uh, I'm a I'm guessing they are we need to file them in a year early as in the deadline currently is in September for the year that's coming 2022-2023 but rather 2023-2024 is that correct? Yeah. Okay because I was a bit confused if it was for next year next academic year or next year yeah. year. That's a very good question so when you see um so Imagine next year you're going into upper sixth or the second year of A-level. Um, you have to apply at the start of the second year at A-level. So that's September. Is September coming in like two months? The October's three months and the January's six months for the year you would be applying. So they're the deadlines. So it will be September. Well, the first deadline is October the 15th, 2022 for September 23 entry. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you very much. I should probably add as well, if you wanted to, you can apply for deferred entry, which means you can technically apply in September 2022 for 2024 entry. Um, if you know you're going to take a gap year or if you have to take a gap year for some reason, you can do deferred entry if you wanted. I understand. And that's that's sort of the limit, the yeah, two years. Um, I'm guessing you can't apply and then go 10 years later. No, I don't know why you would, but sadly not. No, I don't think I'm taking a gap here. I, it was just a curiosity question, I guess. Thank you. I think, I um, think that's Darren, really... Sorry. No, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think for specific reasons, you can add an extension, usually at most one or two years to your deferral, um, usually medical reasons, for example. Um, but yeah, I think one or two years of holding your offer is about the limit for most universities. I also think I, I, I don't know of anyone planning a gap year, but anything can happen in the next year. But you should always apply if you know you're going to take a gap year, you should always apply and defer because when you're away traveling around the world, the last thing you want to do is start chasing up references for, from me, starting to write personal statements from scratch. Yet you, your brain's never going to be in it. So if you are thinking of doing a gap year, still apply this year and then defer it for a year don't don't give it a year and say oh i'll just leave it a year you might as well do the process now and if you get the help it's not sensible to leave it a year any other questions i've got no other hands at the moment mm. ahmed hi what exactly is a gap year that's a good question. <laughs> um, a gap year is just a year where you're not in school and you're not in university. Um, so a lot of people choose to take them. Some people want to work for a year to save up money for university. Uh, some people want to travel for a year. So after you finish high school and before you start university is probably one of your most free times. <laughs> no, no stress, no pressure, <laughs> no dependence, nothing. <laughs> um, so a lot of people go traveling. And um, there are some people, for example, national service, 
Uh, some countries still require national service. So once they finish when they're 18, they're not allowed to join university until they've done a year of national service, for example. Um, it's not exactly a gap year, but it's the gap year is just any year between finishing high school and starting university. Whatever you do with it, <laughs> it's a gap. Okay, so it's like a cultural kind of. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's just a chance for students to kind of be more culturally, I guess. Um, flourished. I mean, that would nice. be the ideal. <laughs> <laughs> nice terms, but I, I'll, I'll be honest, Ahmed, I know people that have taken a gap year to go party in Australia for a year. Um, it, it's oh, entirely up to them. Some right. people will, because when you finish uni, most people go straight to work, Ahmed, and then that's the sort of free, you've no freedom ever again, because you start getting, becoming okay. an adult, you have right. to start paying bills, you just can't. When you're 18, you've got no responsibilities, you've got no bills. Right. You can save up, work for six months, go save up a few thousand, go to go to Australia, go to uh, interrail and around Europe, do something fun. You can live on a budget and, and it doesn't matter. You're just there to have fun. As you get older, it becomes nearly impossible to do that because you've got so many life commitments. Right. OK. Yeah, that it's mostly sense. about enjoying yourself. Uh, uh, you, you've right, given yeah. it a lovely term with the, <laughs> your, your <laughs> The cultural understanding but mostly it's right. for people just to have, have a bit of fun because as you get older that chance just doesn't exist you know you, you're not going to get a 40 year old traveling around the world on their own uh, partying for a year a they're going to be too old b they're going to be too tired and c it's just going to look weird why is a 40 year old traveling around the world partying on their own <laughs> so when you're 18 or 22 they're the only real times people go for gap years okay um yeah. midweeka <clears throat> Um, so my question is, um, should the course that we envision to take have a relation to our A-levels? Because I know that um, some people would take, oh, um, I don't know, like a medical A-level that would relate to medicine, such as biology, um, chemistry, and so forth. Um, but let's say if you have those A-levels, could you potentially apply to a course that is not related to it? Or is it very specific? Yeah, sorry, I probably should have clarified that. I think I didn't really mention it enough. Um, a lot of courses, you do have to take certain exams in high school. Um, so generally, for example, sciences, uh, maths, you normally have to do maths for A-level or in high school. Um, science courses like physics, quite often universities say you have to have either maths or physics at high school in order to take that course. So on the reverse of that, yes. You do have to have certain subjects, but equally some courses don't have any kind of requirements. Um, so things like social sciences, um, often things like psychology, for example, you can do with any A-levels. Um, so you could have English literature, philosophy, economics, and you could go into a lot of social sciences with that. Um, you could go into things like classics or uh, archaeology with those sort of subjects. Um, so no, you don't have to do things related to your A-level, but sometimes a course requires you to have certain A-levels. Um, so both sides are technically true. OK, because um, I, I don't know why I chose um, medicine as like the field, but I was just mostly thinking of social sciences for myself. But in terms of if I could, you know, switch between if I took, I don't know, law, could I go into business for it? For instance, you know, that's where I was mostly envisioning. Yeah, your A-levels don't dictate what you have to do at university. Um, sometimes they can limit what you do at university. So like you said, medicine, you would normally need either chemistry or biology in order to do a medical course. Um, but no, what you do at A-level doesn't define what you have to do at university at all. <laughs> I know your options, Ludwika, so pretty much your options are wide open. Um, I think one of the one of I know what you do at the moment. So one of the things that I always have a very simple way of thinking about this. If you want to do anything science or medicine related at university, you need to be doing sciences at A levels. If you want to do engineering, you need to be doing maths at A level. Everything else. It doesn't it, it doesn't matter as much what you do for A levels, but if you're going to a science or engineering field, then you have to. But everything else, as long as you've got good grades, it doesn't really matter. I think that would be the only ones that really matter. Maybe languages. You can't go and study Spanish if you can't speak Spanish. 
Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can do it without any prior knowledge of Spanish at all. I would struggle greatly doing that. <laughs> uh, any other questions, folks? Can, can I ask a, a question, I suppose, that may apply to, to some people? Why, if if I lived internationally, which I can see about four of the kids anyway here do, maybe five actually, um, why would I want to go to uni in the UK? It's a good question and I guess part of it, <clears throat> it's entirely personal. <laughs> I mean, there are some very nice locations in the world, so I'm not sure where everyone is living. Um, but generally, the UK is incredibly well thought of for careers. Um, so not just obviously in the UK, uh, but internationally, UK degrees open a lot of doors to different companies, to different uh, careers. They're also one of the most widely accepted. Uh, so in terms of if you're going into further research, because a lot of our degrees are heavily uh, research focused, it's quite easy to get, not easy, but it's a lot simpler to get academic jobs post university because you've already got the good grounding. Uh, they're also only three years. As far as I'm aware, America demands four years of you. It's a lot of time studying. Um, there's a lot of different variety as well. So most universities in the UK, um, they're not focused. So places like Durham, which offer sciences, social sciences, arts, humanities, health, sports, all the different faculties. So you get a very diverse experience, no matter what course you're studying, um, which I think can help you quite a lot in terms of gaining skills, meeting new people uh, getting jobs and careers at the end of it as well. Um, you're not going to things like a, a sciences university. Some of them do exist, but broadly speaking, the UK is quite diverse in the universities and what they offer. Um, so it does allow you to gain an awful lot of different experiences and ideas as well. Um, also, some of it's very pretty. It's probably a lot colder and drier than places many people might be located. <laughs> but the UK does have a lot of cultural history. Um, it is well located if you want to travel during the summer, for example. It's quite easy to get onto continental Europe and interrail, as suggested. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of options, but some of it might be quite personal. Um, mostly, though, students like it for the career opportunities uh, and how it ranks you in good stead for those. I ask one other question, sorry, because I don't know the answer to this myself, and I'll probably get asked it at some stage. If I'm coming from a, an international country, for example, we've got a, kids here from, I see America, I see Turkey, I see France, I see Gambia, so it's so a different parts of the world. Um, does the university, and maybe you might know the answer to this, do they help them sort of fit in, settle in? How do they sort of integrate them? Because I've you know, I just went to a university an hour and a half from my house, so I don't know the answer. Do they, what way would that, how would that work or what would that, because I'm sure that's probably quite stressful to come across the world. Yeah, um, so most universities will have, uh, first of all, they have Freshers Week. All new first years come a week before term starts, um, because as I said, the majority of students do actually move to go to university. Um, so most students are living on campus in a new place for the first time, regardless of what country they're originally from. Um, so most students won't know where the laundry is or where the supermarket is <laughs> and things like this. Uh, so everyone arrives a week beforehand. Most universities, as far as I know, I don't know any that don't, will also have International Freshers Week, which is a week before that. So everyone who is not currently based in the UK is invited to arrive two weeks before term starts. So they normally have international ambassadors who can help you set up the practical aspects of life. Um, things like getting a bank account, a mobile phone number, um, registering with a doctor. Other things you have to do, like um, something called a BRP that you have to get, uh, health insurance if you need it. So they help you with all the practical matters. And they also do things like social events. Uh, so they might do like um, orienteering around the city. So you get to meet other international students, Durham has a college system which is intentionally diverse. So students from different nationalities will always intentionally be spread around colleges, uh, which means that you never sort of have an international accommodation block. <laughs> Everyone will always be fully integrated into the college life and systems. Um, but International Freshers Week tends to be one of the best ways to learn about the city and feel comfortable living there even before other students arrive. 
Um, so once other students arrive, you actually, in a way, international freshers normally know more about the university before UK freshers arrive, which is quite nice because often you get UK freshers asking international freshers questions like, where is the supermarket? Um, so in a way, you're kind of set up as more knowledgeable, <laughs> which is helpful. Um, but other than that, I guess because you're all mixing, most universities are pretty international. Durham is 33% international students um, from 150 different countries. So they tend to just by their nature be relatively diverse in terms of the courses. Um, accommodation, again, most universities first years will live on university accommodation generally if they have enough. Um, and international students are normally given priority for that. Uh, so you're living within university accommodation, you get to see the same people every day. Uh, you meet people wandering around looking for their towel when they're in the shower, weird things like that. Um, so everyone is new usually at university. Um, but yeah, I guess International Freshers Week is something to look forward to. <laughs> oh, they do trips to Ikea as well in case you need bedding. The highlight. I think, I think if, if you've been to <laughs> Ikea, I think that might put you off going to university. <laughs> That's uh, why we wait till you arrive. <laughs> We, we have a few more minutes if anyone's got uh, any final questions. If there's anything anyone would like to ask, if not, don't worry. Um, I know uh, Lauren has told us loads of incredibly useful things and I never knew there was such thing as International Freshers Week. That's probably, I never expected to learn. I knew I'd learned something this morning. I didn't think I'd learned something that important. Uh, Alexandru. <clears throat> Uh, speaking of which, with uh, accommodations and uh, and such, uh, do universities, UKS universities, offer uh, living space or do they offer living uh, facilities such as, as you said, bedding and such? Is it, do you just get an empty room that you need to furnish yourself or is it already furnished in most cases? Um, so it can vary a bit. Uh, it does entirely depend on the university and what accommodation they own. But I think generally you will find furniture. So you'll find a bed with a mattress, desk, wardrobe, um, big things you will have. Usually it doesn't have things like bedding. Um, they have curtains, obviously. I don't know why that's obvious, but bedding isn't. <laughs> um, they won't have things, uh, personal things like posters. Uh, usually they don't yeah. have bedding. Um, yeah. You can sometimes, it depends on how the university is set up, but you can sometimes request. Um, so they might have like, um, they usually call them different things, but like starter kits. Uh, so it might include like a saucepan, bedding, and some cutlery, because not all universities have shared kitchen facilities. So that depends a bit, um, but it's entirely up to the university whether they do that. So quite often students might come and literally the very first thing they do is go on a bus to Ikea. <laughs> potentially. Um, but yes, I wouldn't expect bedding. Uh, even that though will vary. Some of them have pillows and duvets, but not covers, for example. Um, but yes, you will have furniture if they offer accommodation. They should include furniture like desks and beds, but don't expect much else. Okay, My advice, you. Alexander, is expect the unexpected. <laughs> Set expectations low for when you, what you're going to get and see everything in the room except a bed and wardrobe as a bonus. Uh, and most people also, the reason they won't have bed is because most people won't want to use bed and that other people have used forever. So most things are for hygiene reasons. But uh, yeah, no, I understand. I was yeah, I was referring to uh, to the furniture itself. Most Yeah, that will always be there, but there won't be TVs normally. Normally you'll have to buy a tally or whatever most in today's world you don't even use tvs you use laptops and ipads and tablets these are too cool and trendy to have a big massive tv in the room yeah. <laughs> uh we have time and maybe is, for go ahead alexander sir. if if nobody else wants to ask anything that is you yeah, please ask away ask ask okay uh <clears throat> Is accommodation included in the cost of the university or is it an additional cost? It's additional. So what you normally have is two costs. You have the tuition fee, which is the cost of the course, the facilities, um, everything pertaining to getting your degree. And then you have what's usually called a maintenance cost, which is your living costs. 
um, which would include things like accommodation, your electricity bills, um, anything else like food, eating, drinking. Um, so it's up to you to a certain extent to budget that. Um, most universities, as I say, they have some kind of accommodation um, or you would rent privately. So it might be the case that universities can help you, but you would just make some friends super quick and rent a house or rent student specific accommodation within a city. Um, but yeah, the cost is separate. So accommodation, your living costs, um, they would be different to your tuition fee. Um, as Mr. Boyan said, some students do actually go to university within the town they live in or within access from their family house. So it's not included in the fees for tuition, no. OK, thank you. Amazing. I'm not sure we've got any other questions. Uh, I think all hands are down brilliant. I just want to say a massive thank you. Um, I found it incredibly helpful. I'm sure the students did as well. Um, it's been a really nice start um, before next Wednesday when they look at it um, and they have to think about it a little bit more specifically in instead of broadly. Uh, it was really, really helpful. I, I genuinely mean that. Um, it's lovely for the, for the students because they are from all different backgrounds to hear from a really good UK university from the perspective on what they need to do and, and just to have a chance to ask questions to someone that isn't me. <laughs> So thank you so much. Uh, we we will give a wee virtual round of applause as we always do. You'll get lots of little virtual claps. Yeah, I did see them. They were adorable. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I did say I am happy to do things specifically about personal statements, maybe at the beginning of next term when you realise how daunting they are. <laughs> if you're they a summer free. <laughs> they are going to um, experience.